Hello, everyone, and welcome to our final Dairy Foods Virtual Office Hours for 2023. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Elizabeth Demings. I'm with the Institute for Food Safety at Cornell University, and I'm going to be the moderator for today's session. Um, unfortunately, Sam Elkane had a conflict come up, so he's not able to join us today, but he will be back um, as your loyal moderator for this series um, in the new year. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, there have been several recalls due to the potential for sanitizers, contaminating milk, I mean, even other um, beverages distributed to consumers and institutions in the recent years. And so today we're really gonna be discussing some of those efforts to help reduce that sanitizer contamination in milk supplies. So we have two um, presenters for today. Um, the first is Sophia Stiffelmeyer. She is with the, she is the Milk Operations Branch Manager at the Texas Department of State Health Services. She has been with the Texas Department of State Health Services for 16 years. Her responsibilities include managing the quality assurance for milk inspections, uh, milk samples, Texas state ratings, and laboratory evaluations. And Sophia currently serves on the executive board for the National Conference on Interstate Milk Shipments. And she's the chair um, of the Proposal 101 Adulteration Prevention Study Committee, um, which she's gonna talk about um, today. Our second presenter is Dr. Alyosu Chantik, who also goes by Al. Al is a senior extension associate in the Department of Food Science um, here at Cornell University. He is uh, part of the Dairy Foods Extension Program, and he also does research that helps to support the dairy industry with the Milk Quality Improvement Program, um, which he's going to talk about one of their research projects today. Uh, following our two presentations, um, we're going to have a moderated uh, Q&A with, um, with our panel um, of experts. We have both joining the two presenters. We have uh, representatives from the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets from the Division of Milk Control and Dairy Services, the Director Casey McHugh on this call. Uh, we also have colleagues from Cornell University. Um, we have Dr. Nicole Martin. Um, she is the uh, Associate Director of the Milk Quality Improvement Program, and she's a Research Assistant Professor um, here at Cornell. And um, we should also have uh, Rob Rallier joining the call. Yep, he's here. Um, and Rob is a senior extension associate with the Dairy Foods Extension Program. He's also the manager of the Food Processing and Development Lab uh, at Cornell. When we go into the Q&A, we will address some of the questions that you submitted in advance, um, as well as any other questions that come up, uh, either during the presentations or in the discussion that follows. And if you have any questions, um, you can feel free to type them into your chat box um, or um, you can unmute yourself, ask them live. You can send me um, questions directly. Um, if you called in and you're on the phone today, you can also um, unmute yourself by pressing star six uh, to ask your question. And so with that, I will stop sharing my screen and uh, Sophia, I'll let you take it away. Hey, one second. Okay, so Proposal 101 Adulteration Prevention Study Committee okay, is- We don't see your presentation. No, you don't see it. Okay, well, I see it on my end. Let me- Sorry, give me one more minute, share. Can you see it now? Uh, yep, and then you'll wanna go into that presentation mode. Is that working? Yep, it's perfect, thank you. Perfect, okay, sorry, technical difficulties. Okay, so Proposal 101 was introduced at the um, 2023 NCIMS conference and was ultimately passed. So the goal of this proposal um, was to create a study committee and we have been charged to identify and develop um, strategies to prevent contamination of grade A milk and milk products with the sanitizers after the CIP process. 
And in with developing these prevention strategies, um, the committee has been charged to at least consider the two bullet points listed, um, which grade A milk and milk products should be addressed through these prevention strategies, and also the potential means to minimize the contamination, such as regulatory activities, community outreach with industry, identifying training gaps, um, food safety training, and industry best practices. And ultimately, um, the committee will provide a report on our activities at the next conference. So this proposal is our roadmap to um, to ultimately reach the goal of what um, what the committee needs to provide for the next conference. So here are our regulatory committee members. Um, myself, Sophia, with um, I'm with Texas. We have Eric Gladdy with New York, Brian Wise with Ohio. Nathan Campbell, Indiana, Dustin Cox, New Mexico, and Shannon Maloney with Missouri. Our industry committee members, Brad Schilling, he is also uh, the vice chair and he's with Prairie Farms. We have Roger Huey with DFA, Sabina Alexander with Highland, Violet Martin with General Mills, and Denise Dufrance with Saputo. Here are our non-voting committee members. We have Dr. Nicole Martin with Cornell, John Allen with IDFA, Brooke Sherman with Ecolab, Clay Deflison with National Milk, Dr. Beth Brzezinski with FDA, and Clint George with FDA. So those are all the committee members for our Proposal 101 Adulteration Study Committee. So, I don't have a lot to present on committee activities. Uh, we had our first meeting in September. We've met um, three times since we received approval from the executive board on our committee members. And we've met once in September, October, and then we just had our November meeting last week. And um, currently we've worked on creating a risk assessment. And the goal of the risk assessment was to properly identify the different processes um, and the products that were the largest risk to the public. And we wanted to do this, which the goal of it is to help identify, um, help us to identify where we need to focus as a committee to reach the objectives outlined in Proposal 101. Um, from our last meeting last week, we did discuss a risk assessment that industry um, helped create, and we talked about various numbers. And some of the, the comments in our next steps were, you know, it's been determined there are hundreds of thousands of CIP washes that occur monthly at our grade A facilities. So if you look at the... Um, the adulteration occurrences to the number of washes, the margin of error is relatively low, um, which was expected. Our industry um, does a great job at trying to protect that milk supply. But what the committee is now looking at is there are hundreds of thousands of CIP washes that occur monthly at the facilities. And each time one of those washes happens, that's a risk that could, um, that something could potentially occur. Um, so what we're doing now is trying to, to look at that angle and we're working towards developing a best practice document. So that's the next step that the committee is working on. What is that best, what should that best practice document look like? Um, so based on our meeting last week, we've developed a subcommittee and the goal of the subcommittee is going to kind of outline what we think a best practice document should contain. And then we're meeting again in January with the larger committee to start kind of filling in, um, filling in that document on what, what would best practices look like for industry. Um, we, we know that training has been identified. Uh, we know that um, industry, like regulatory and, and all the other kind of work field has been hit with new employees and COVID and things like that. So we're trying to focus on creating some type of guidance to provide um, to industry to use as a best practice to to prevent this contamination from occurring again. Um, 
In addition to the best practices, the committee also is discussing putting a narrative in there to explain to employees why these best practices are necessary, um, how quickly something could go wrong if they're not properly followed, and what is the cause and effect. So we know, um, based on the, the previous incidences, that children you know, were consuming the product and, and were ill. We also know the companies lost money with that. Um, but one thing that the committee wants to make sure is that those employees that are on the ground floor understand those risks as well. So that's that's our next steps as a committee. Um, that's really all that I, I have to pr present. Uh, again, we've only met three times, so um, I will pass it, pass it back to you, Beth. Great, no, that, thank you so much for that update. Um, it's really great to know that you guys are working collectively to try to establish some of those best practices for the industry. Believe it, um, extremely useful, I'm sure. And then also just, you know, highlighting how important it is that all workers in your facility know what the proper steps are um, to take when it when it comes to, um, you know, using these these heavy duty chemicals, right? So, um, so uh, with that, um, we're going to continue the discussion um, with with Al, who's going to be presenting um, developing the best practices for prevention of sanitizer and milk. And this again is some of the work that he's doing with the milk quality improvement program. So Al, over to you. Thank you, Beth. Um, so I will take the next 20 minutes to give you um, some of our results on our current project uh, that's dealing with this topic of milk adulteration uh, with sanitizers. Um, and I probably don't have to uh, go over why preventing adulteration with sanitizer is important and why this uh, topic is relevant. Um, we had two recent incidences in Northeast. Um, there are also other examples. If you look at um, uh, the rest of the country, uh, there's definitely a public health impact and there's also a business impact for individual processors and basically entire dairy industry. Uh, since the overall image uh, and consumer confidence in milk and dairy products um, can be degraded um, with this um, incidences. This is just one recent example from last month. Uh, just wanted to say this is a relevant issue. It's not isolated to just dairy industry. It's not isolated just to U.S. Um, here it looks like some soda drinks in Europe got contaminated with a cleaning agent at least 45 people exposed, four people hospitalized, uh, and two different products uh, recalled. So in this specific uh, project, the goal was to first ask the fluid milk processors, what are their current practices to prevent unintentional adulteration of milk with sanitizers? Uh, and in the second part, to evaluate some of these uh, practices. Um, Specifically, how well can, for example, a person detect a sanitizer in milk by smelling it? Uh, how well can different rapid tests like uh, test strips or titration kits detect sanitizer in milk? Uh, and then once we have this, uh, finish this work, uh, we, we are planning on sum summarizing this, these results in some type of guidance, which probably could also be part of this uh, uh, proposal 101 uh, that Sophia talked about. So to get the information on what are the current practices, we put together a survey uh, that was sent out specifically to fluid milk processors and 11 of the uh, processors responded by filling out the survey. Uh, we asked about the tests and strategies of making sure raw milk does not come in already adulterated with sanitizers. What type of sanitizers are they using in the processing plan and at what concentrations? Uh, questions about how are they using these sanitizers? And then finally, we ask them about strategies they have in place to prevent adulteration of the final product with sanitizers. Uh, we know that a number of them are using sensory evaluation to determine if sanitizer is present or not. So we ask them uh, about those procedures as well. Um, so if I go immediately into results, um, there are two general sanitizers used by fluid milk processors on food contact surfaces. So chlorine compounds and then uh, peroxyacetic acid or PAA. Uh, the processors that report using chlorine compounds were all small processors. 
uh, one small processor reported using both PAA and uh, chlorine compounds, uh, but all large processors reporting using PAA and no chlorine compounds. Um, what are the strategies that they rely on to prevent adulteration of raw milk from coming into the processing flow? Uh, about half of them report having a documented sniff test done on each load of raw milk coming in. Uh, more than 80% say they do a documented check of raw milk silo to make sure it is empty before pumping the raw milk into it. Um, about half of them do cryoscope testing on raw milk and believe that this will indicate presence of sanitizer. Um, some of them measure pH of milk. Uh, some of them measure density with uh, lactometer uh, and one processor reported testing raw milk for density and components using uh, lactic check and relying uh, on this to indicate the presence of sanitizer in raw milk. Um, a note here, if you if you combine all of the percentages, you will see that the sum is more than 100%. This is because most processors rely on more than one strategy to make sure raw milk is not adulterated. Um, average processor uh, relies on two strategies, and we had one processor that uh, reports four different strategies uh, that they rely on. What about strategies within the processing plant to prevent adulteration of the final product? Uh, so most, but not all, are doing a visual check of the pastur pasteurized milk tanks and uh, filler bowls to make sure these are empty before pumping pasteurized milk into it. Uh, a comment here. So not doing this specific visual check, you can imagine that this is really something that opens the door to uh, mixing final product with sanitizer, including potentially introducing large quantities of sanitizer into the final product. Um, when it comes to introducing large quantities of sanitizer into milk, uh, if the final product is filled into containers that are not see-through, for example, paperboard cartons, uh, large contamination like they could go through uh, un unnoticed, right? If there's no control strategies after the filling process. And this could be maybe considered even more risky if I show you the next results. So one third of processors that we interviewed uh, keeps their lines uh, or filler bowls flooded with sanitizers when not in production. So for example, overnight. Uh, and then two thirds of them uh, are not discarding any product at the start of filling. So not discarding the first product coming off of the filler that would contain any potential uh, residual sanitizer pre present in lines or in filler bowl uh, at the start of filling. Um, we're happy that most processors do not report practicing these most risky combinations, but one processor did report keeping lines flooded without discarding any product at filling. Additionally, two processors reported keeping the lines flooded with sanitizer, uh, but one processor reported that they are not documenting checking the, the P tanks and filler bowls if they're empty before they use them. And one reported that this documentation is not kept con uh, consistent uh, or verified. Uh, if I go back to the previous slide, another common practice is pushing the sanitizer with a product and observing when flown turns from translucent liquid to milk before starting the filling process. Um, the small processors are the ones that are not uh, 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 doing this practice, the large processors are practicing this. However, more than half of them do not have this step documented. So not recording or verifying that this step is performed. Again, there are some processors that are measuring density, pH, freezing point, uh, testing for milk components using lactic check or uh, milk or scan. Um, there are also processors that are using these uh, rapid test kits like uh, test strips or titration kits to test the product for presence of sanitizers. Um, and then more than 60% of uh, processors report doing some type of sensory evaluation on the final product and relying on this uh, strategy to, to uh, detect uh, sanitizer in the final products. So this is why we asked some questions about the sensory part. Uh, so Sensor evaluation is, uh, is reported to be performed by either filler operator, lab staff, 
or a quality manager. And half of them uh, are doing this sensory next to the filler at the beginning of filling, uh, or 75% report uh, doing sensory in the lab. Uh, we had two processes that report doing both sensory uh, in the lab and next to the filler. I think the key part here is that evaluation should be performed at the start of filling, since this is when the risk of introducing sanitizer into the milk uh, is the highest. And maybe the sensory is preferably to be done away from the filler and the processing environment, since this is the environment where where sanitizers are being used and the background uh, smells might maybe limit uh, the, the ability to detect uh, sanitizer in, in the product. Um, so 78% of processors report training people to do sensory analysis on fluid milk. Uh, two thirds of them say they repeat the training every year and one third say they provide training once before the person is assigned to the, uh, to the task. And then we have about 20% of people uh, that are doing sensory, but are never trained to do uh, this specific task. Now, this, these are the results of our uh, own study uh, where we looked into how well a trained sensory panelist, an, an expert or untrained person representing a consumer can detect PAA or chlorine sanitizer in milk. Uh, so this is focusing specifically on smell. Are they, uh, uh, how well are they able to smell uh, the sanitizer in milk? Overall result is that even though there is some indication on this slide and the sl slides to follow, uh, is that some, uh, in some examples, expert panelists might be better at detecting sanitizers in milk, uh, but there is, um, uh, based on these results that we have, we don't have a, a, a statistical support uh, for that. Uh, for example, here on the left figure, uh, for specifically for PAA, it looks like average detection threshold level for experts is around one ppm, but the standard deviation you can see it's uh, it's very, relatively large, forty eight. Uh, so based on that, we cannot say that this is any better than the thirteen ppm detection threshold uh, for untrained uh, consumers. And then on the right figure, uh, you can see that uh, a similar threshold limit for chlorine sanitizer and milk was determined for both trained and untrained panelists around seven to eight ppm. Uh, we did another study with these two groups to specifically look into training. Can we train people to be better at detecting sanitizer in, in milk? Um, and a note here, when I say experts, I, uh, I mean people that were trained in fluid milk defect judging and people that have experience in fluid milk defect judging. Posts. So these experts were never trained specifically to detect uh, PA or chlorine sanitizer in milk. Um, so in this study that follows, uh, we did just that. We, we did a single training on chlorine sanitizer on, on PA uh, with both groups and we looked into uh, improvements. Um, and you can see um, that, that the results of, of uh, specifically for, for, for PAA, the top results for experts and bottom for consumers. Uh, so people that were not previous, that don't have previous experience in sensory evaluation, both results uh, sh uh, show. Um, so we have results on the left before the training and on the right uh, after training. Um, and we uh, present the results as percent accuracy. So what is the percent of samples that are correctly identified? Uh, and you can see that uh, in both cases, um, both tested groups showed slight improvement, uh, but uh, again, nothing statistically significant. Um, and when we look at results from the chlorine in milk, um, we see similar uh, results with no statistical significance. So a single training session did not significantly improve the ability to, de to detect sanitizer in milk. Um, and this is the same for experts, non-experts, uh, PAA, chlorine, so no improvement after that single uh, training session. This is a different representation of the same results. Uh, so comparing sensitivity uh, over different concentrations we tested. So how well experts and non-experts can detect sanitizer in milk at the different levels. 
uh, we tested them at 0 0.2 ppm, at 2 ppm, 20 ppm. Um, so these would be like uh, no rinse solution of sanitizer that's typically around 200 ppm, contaminates milk at 10%, 1%, or 0.1%. Uh, so left uh, results are for PAA, uh, right uh, figure results for chlorine. Uh, the red boxes are non-expert or consumer, and gray boxes um, uh, experts. So, and you can see that even though the difference between experts and non-experts is not st supported by statistics, as experts are a bit better at detecting the sanitizer, especially at this 20 ppm level. Um, it looks like panelists are, are a bit more sensitive to presence of chlorine compounds in milk, uh, compared to uh, PAA. Um, so based on all these results, we were wondering, is there just like a physiological or a biological capability of some individuals to detect sanitizer in milk uh, while the others are not capable to do that? Uh, for example, similar as some people can detect bitter taste uh, while some other people just cannot at, at any concentration. Um, so to become an expert or to be part of, of an official trained sensory panel, you have to go through this basic screening to see, does your nose work? Does your tongue work? You know, uh, so, so this slight difference we see between experts and non-experts might be just be that non-expert group has some of the people where these the nose maybe is not working 100%. Uh, and this is less likely and the expert group because they went through some sort of a screening at one point. Um, so we are currently analyzing the data from this third study uh, to test this hypothesis. Uh, and if it turns out to be true, what this might mean is that the processors might have to screen available people for ability to detect specific sanitizers. Uh, and they might potentially find out that pillar operators and lab technicians and, and quality managers are not the most sensitive to presence of sanitizer in milk. And maybe someone from administration or a truck driver is identified to be most sensitive and maybe most appropriate person to evaluate the final product for uh, presence of sanitizer. A little bit of advertisement here. So if you are interested in doing any type of screening for sensory panel or any other work related to sensory evaluation, uh, let us know because we can help. So we have uh, Alina uh, Stelic that is running our sensory evaluation center. Obviously, ha she has a lot of experience in this area and has uh, assisted a number of small and large uh, food processors with establishing appropriate uh, sensory evaluation procedures. If I move on, so the next, uh, we evaluated different rapid uh, test kits. Uh, like test strips and titration kits to see how effective and reliable these are. We tested some uh, that uh, processors reported using uh, in the survey, and we tested some additional ones uh, that we were able to find. Uh, altogether, we tested eight different rapid tests, six for PAA and two for uh, chlorine compounds. And these are the results, uh, including some of the photos uh, with the Color, color changes uh, in the uh, rapid tests. Um, so these are the results for the two chlorine tests. Uh, top one is a, uh, is a uh, strips, uh, and the bottom one is a titration uh, kit. Uh, the test strips gave absolutely no signal, even at the highest concentration, 20 ppm. Uh, the titration kit showed slight change in color at 20 ppm, but nothing that could be used uh, in the field probably. Uh, and this was something that was maybe expected. So the amount of the organic material and mo molecules in milk uh, makes it probably uh, almost impossible to detect chlorine in milk using these techniques, even if we use the titration kit that is designed to test for both free residual and total residual chlorine. Um, so the chlorine kits are designed for water, and this is probably the only medium where you can use them. Now, the kits for, uh, for PAA are also designed for water, but it looks like these can be used to some degree in milk to give you uh, some valuable information. And these are the results. Um, so each photo uh, has um, four test strips. And if we go from left to the right, so 
0 0.2 ppm concentration, uh, 2 ppm, 20 ppm, and then negative control. Um, so the first line of photos are results of higher range um, test strips and the green one and the lower range um, uh, titration kits in the orange uh, box. So uh, each one has two photos. Um, one, the first one is after recommended incubation time according to uh, instructions. And then the second one is after this extended uh, time. Um, and it looks like extended time allowed uh, a pretty good detection and differentiation of different concentration, at least uh, the highest concentration, the uh, 20 ppm. And then for the for the uh, titration uh, kit, the low range kit, we were actually also able to quite uh, well detect the, the 2 ppm uh, concentration. The second um, row of photos are results of three uh, test strips designed to detect hydrogen peroxide. And these actually work maybe even better than the, the, the PAA tests. So the PAA sanitizers are a mixture of uh, peroxyacetic acid, hydrogen peroxide, and acetic acid. Uh, and, and usually there is more hydrogen peroxide in those mixes than actual PAA. So it makes sense that uh, these kits uh, uh, for hydrogen peroxide would also work and sometimes even better. Uh, the last line is something we tested because a processor reported uh, using this kit uh, for this pur purpose. Um, so there are commercial rapid test strips to test for presence of alcohol in breast milk. Uh, and we tested them. And to our surprise, the response was in correlation with the presence of PAA in milk. Now, we tried to explain what the mechanism behind it is. Uh, but we were not able to get the information on uh, what, what this test is based on, what is the mechanism of, of detection. Um, so I guess it's some sort of a proprietary uh, technology. Um, so there are enzymes, there are ch chemical reactions that create hydrogen peroxide from uh, uh, alcohol that can be used to detect uh, alcohol. Uh, and if this is used, it would explain the strong col color reaction uh, development uh, due to presence of, of hydrogen peroxide in the in the PAA. Uh, some of the other methods we looked into, so pH and freezing point depression. So pH as expected did not detect uh, added sanitizer. Uh, even though PAA contains acids, uh, these are not strong enough and not present in sufficient amount to eliminate the buffering capacity of milk and change the pH uh, on a detectable scale. When it comes to freezing point depression, uh, so this method is something that works through detection of added water in milk. For example, uh, 20 ppm of sanitizer in milk will be detected if this contamination is introduced through, for example, 10% of no rinse sanitizer introduced into milk because 10% of added water is something that freeze point uh, depression can detect. And you can see this here, right? At 20 ppm, this would be 10% of, of added water. But if the same 20 ppm were introduced through contamination with a concentrated sanitizer, then the freeze point would maybe not change uh, significantly. Uh, to detect these uh, contaminations that introduce little water or make small changes uh, to the freeze point, uh, you would probably need an unadulterated product as a reference to uh, detect the change after water, uh, after water or sanitizer is introduced. Maybe here for 2 ppm, you can see if we have a good control, we can maybe see that there is a, a change uh, after contamination, but hardly uh, something that you could use in the field. So to finish a little bit of uh, take home messages, uh, so some of the uh, practices that different dairy processors have in place to assure microbial safety or quality uh, represents a higher risk for introduction of sanitizer into final product. For example, keeping the lines and filler bowls flooded with sanitizer when not, when not in operation. Uh, most of the processors have one or several strategies in place to prevent introduction of sanitizer into final product. For example, uh, testing or discarding certain number of finished product containers that are filled first on each line. 
Um, some processors are not documenting, recording, or verifying some of the procedures uh, that are in place to prevent introduction of sanitizers into final product. Uh, for example, recording and verifying that the process of, of uh, um, pushing sanitizer with product was complete and confirmed with uh, a visual check. Uh, uh, when PAA is used as a sanitizer in a processing plan, using rapid test kits designed to, uh, to detect PAA or hyd hydrogen peroxide would be more effective at detecting the presence of sanitizer compared to uh, smelling the final product. Uh, well, when it comes to chlorine sanitizer, uh, smelling the final product would be one of the options of detecting uh, chlorine sanitizers since rapid test kits do not work. However, the person that is most appropriate to do this task would probably have to be identified in the company. Now, when it comes to this, most appropriate person to perform a sniff test on a final product might not be the same uh, as the most experienced person in sensory evaluation or maybe most obvious person. You know, for example, it could be an HR person or, you know, and not necessarily uh, a filler operator or lab tech or a, a quality manager. Um, so before we go uh, for uh, questions, I would just like to acknowledge New York State Dairy Promotion Advisory Board for continued support of our research and extension work which also includes some of the work uh, with the, on this uh, sanitizer issue uh, that was presented today. So this, I think we can go on to questions and answers. Great, thank you so much, Al.